Today, we dive into the wonderful world of artistic macro photography. Let's go behind the shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. This is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all those stories and challenges that happen in between. As always, you can find a blog post for this episode along with any links that we mention. And by the way, a sample gallery of my guest work over at BehindTheShot.tv. If you're watching on YouTube, all the links that we mention are also down in the description below the like and subscribe button, which brings me to my guest, somebody I am super excited to get on the show this time around, Nikon Ambassador Joey Terrell. Joey, how are you? Hey, Steve, how are you? Good I'm really you. good. Did I pronounce your last name right? Terrell, Terrell, okay. whatever you want to say. Terrell, and I asked you ahead of time and I knew I'd butcher it. I, I, I messed up the spelling. My apologies. Uh, I am so glad to have you here. There's, there, there's so many things. So I research my guests in depth. And there's so many things in researching you that I kind of learned about you that are super intriguing to me. So I start all of my shows with a, you know, getting to know my guest type section. And in your case, you've got some stuff on your website that I need to talk about. And the first one is a quote. On your website, you say, my camera is the window through which I experience life. And I love yeah, that. I really feel that way. Explain that. I really feel me. that way. Well, it, it's, we as photographers, I really feel as though we get opportunities that other people in other walks of life don't get. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that, you know, I end up walking through doorways that other people may not get to walk through. Um, aside from that, I think that the camera functions sort of as a like a souvenir collector in the sense that as you go along, the experiences you're having with the camera are the you know, that's really what life is. And then for me, you know, the photographs end up being the souvenirs of the experience. Not everyone feels that way, and I understand that. But um, for me, it's a way to experience life, the camera. And the thing is, is if you get bored with what you're doing, you can always do something else. So if one day you're shooting people and you say, I've had enough of shooting portraits of people, right. then you can change and do landscape, or you can do macro, or you can do whatever. Which, okay, which leads me to my next thing. You, we're going to talk about macro photography today, but your career has included architecture, which my last show actually was an architecture photographer, photographer out of the Czech Republic. You've done interior design stuff, advertising, corporate photography, golf, uh, golf course landscapes, editorial sure. portraiture. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Again, a quote. Your about page says, it's quote, the rich potential within macro photography that has always been a fascination with all that you've shot. What is it about macro photography? Well, it's um, my brother is also a photographer and he and I had a conversation once where the conversation went something like this and that so much of the commercial work that I was doing uh, at the time that we had the conversation was, you know, there's so much integration between art directors and creative design people and all of that, that you end up looking at the picture and you say, you know, some part of it is mine, but some part of it is also other people's and I'm compromising all along the way. The one thing about macro photography, at least for me, is, is that there are no compromises. It's, it's the way that I do it is um, I start with an idea and I build it out and then I photograph it and I do the post-processing and all of that. And at the end of it, if it's any good, it's all me. If it's no good, that's all me too. Whereas in the, so much of the commercial stuff, it's a collaboration of minds. This is very much a, um, it's the kind of thing, and it's also, it's the kind of thing that you can do anywhere. You can do it at your kitchen table. You can do it in a garage. You can do it anywhere you want. Whereas if you're gonna do a really beautiful fashion shoot, you need a set and a model and a makeup and hair people and on and on like that. This is something that, you know, so much of it is under your control. And so from a creative standpoint, I really feel as though you can do anything with macro and never run out of things to do. So I love 
that kind of viewpoint. And and you're right when you're when you're doing almost any other type of genre of photography, mm -hmm. the architecture photographer I just had on Jerry Lisler, you know, the shot that he shot of a hotel pool, the day that he was scheduled to shoot that pool happened to be completely overcast and you couldn't see the skyline of Prague. So we had to have somebody go back another day and shoot through the windows to get that and had to then sandwich it together. Whereas right. with macro photography from moment one, you are more in control, even a basic portrait, really. You can only coach yeah. somebody so far. But your client list is Fortune 500 stuff, Fortune 50 stuff, mm -hmm. American Express, Coca-Cola, Disney, Golf Digest, Major League Baseball, Red Bull, Sports Illustrated, which brings in the, the sad part of the talk. And of course, Nikon, because yeah. you're a Nikon ambassador. You've right. taught at places like Photo Expo Plus, WPPI, which I was just at, CES, Imaging USA. I went to my first one in January out in Louisville. Uh, Nikon School, of course, again, Nikon ambassador. The clientele that you're working with, mm -hmm. it's rare air for most photographers, right? For people that aren't at that level yet, is there, you know, people that want to get that level of clientele, is there any key tip, and this may or may not be photography-based, it may be business-based, it may be communication-based, but do you have any tip for reaching these corporate clients and getting into that type of clientele? Uh, absolutely, um, but it's probably not the kind of tip that you're, you think I'm going to, because it's not business-related, it's photography-related. One of the things about photography, um, and I, this is not news, but photography, the cameras have become so good that everybody begins from an elevated place. So I always use the analogy, you know, my mom, who's 86 years old, she's not a photographer. She wouldn't know which end of a camera is the right end of the camera. But I could literally set up the camera in the morning for her and then hand it to her. And in the afternoon, she can take a technically proficient picture. But the bad news is, is that's true for everybody. It used to be that, you know, you needed to have all kinds of technical understanding, right. follow focus ability, know the difference between, you know, shutter speed, f-stop, ISO, and how that all worked together. Now, the cameras are so good, that's not really true, which means everyone starts from an elevated spot, which also means you have to find a way to be different, to be unique, to do something that other people can't do. And what I've learned, and I learned this, um, I've been you know, teaching workshops and things like that for 25 years. And in, as I meet photographers, I learned that there's a very small percentage of them that are willing to do that extra bit. Um, and those are the people that can be successful, the ones that are willing to do the extra bit. And usually that revolves somewhere around lighting, learning how to light and learning how to control light because so many photographers are not willing to do that, the ones that are will always be successful because it's something you can apply across specialties. No matter what, whether you're shooting portraits or you're doing macro, whatever it is, light always plays a role. And if you can harness it and shape it and be good at it, um, people will come knocking at your door. Okay, fantastic tip, actually. And I always look at things, and this was something I learned when I used to teach uh, IT type courses. And I always look at things as how the owner of the company that I taught for used to put it in. And that is what he called one percenters. You know, you can have a bunch of people that are landscape photographers, uh, corporate photographers, editorial photographers, portrait photographers, sports photographers, my case, music photographers. And when you talk about differentiating yourself, it comes down to me too. What are those things that you do that elevate you even just by 1%. It can be little right. teeny things. It can be, it can literally just be how you deliver the images, right? I know a yes. ton of people who deliver images to a client and the client gets a folder of, I'm going to make up a number to be absurd in this particular case, but the client gets a folder of 300 images and okay. So now your client is left arrowing through 300 images to find the one that they actually want to post on Instagram or social media. But, and of course you're not going to give 300. I'm being absurd, but I always take the time to print out a PDF contact sheet so that they mm -hmm. can browse through a PDF contact sheet on their screen and find the image easily that way. It's those, mi the, the, those minute details that just make 
the entire experience either a better end result like your lighting or a better experience from the user question. But in the end, it's the photo, right? So I, I ask every guest this question, and I, I don't mean about your work, just photography in general. Mm -hmm. What makes a great photo great? Well, it's, it's it can be a lot of things, obviously, depending on the kind of photo that it is. I mean, I think about some of the greatest Pulitzer Prize winning photos of all time, and I think they move me in some way. Um, you, and they're usually pictures of people, and they're they're moving in some way. Um, pictures that are you know something maybe more abstract. Some of the work that I do, uh, I look at other people's work that is in more in that genre and it's it's like am i fascinated by it am i do i look at it and i say what's going on in this picture how is that done what am i actually looking at and that that to me is what makes things interesting it's not unlike any other uh, you know if you if you like food if you eat ordinary food then you think of it as ordinary food if you eat extraordinary food then you think of it as extraordinary and you know the difference Right. Um, I think photography is like that. I mean, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think, you know, a great photograph when you see one, even if it's your own, you're like, uh, that's a six. And, you you know, if you're honest with yourself, you know, the difference. It, it can't always be a 10. But I right. think, you know, when it's a 10, you know, it's a 10. OK, that's the, that's a perfect answer. I want to go. I want to circle back to something you said, because when I when I asked you the the tip for people getting that kind of clientele you you went into lighting. And I will say, looking at your portfolio, looking at all your work uh, across genres, you clearly, in my opinion, see light. I don't want to say different than most people. I want to say better than most people. Like you, you clearly see light in a very special way. Thank so you. circling back to that, having to know light, what is the key? Because I, I, you're right. I think this is an area. I think it's an area a lot of people don't dive into, because mm -hmm. they simply don't truly understand what they're doing. And I don't mean from a technical point of view. They don't know how to change the power on a light. They can. They can at this point go to YouTube and find a light position and just shoot. You know, with what somebody told them, where somebody told them to put the light. But they don't see right. the light the same way. W what is yeah. the key? to somebody understanding light, real light as a photographer? Um, you said it several times, it's seeing light. You don't have to, um, you don't have to actually, it isn't, it isn't about the technical part of lighting. It's about, you said it, it's about seeing it. And, and you can see it on a daily basis uh, in the sense that just standing, I, this happens to me all the time, just standing at your kitchen sink, watching the light as it comes through the window and how it, you know, goes between the leaves of a plant or hits the faucet in just a certain way. And you notice it that the key part of it is seeing it. Um, I, I, I read this book about 10 years ago. It's a fantastic book. It's called On Looking. And the, the book was all about the way that people see what their specialty is. So, for example, this author, what they did is they walked around a block in New York City and they they took different people with them. So one day it would be a veterinarian and another day it would be an architect. And what ended up happening is, is the vet, vet, veterinarian sees dogs and doesn't notice the architecture. The architect sees the buildings, doesn't even see the dogs because what you focus on is really what you see. And so if you get yourself in a place where you want to see light and light is a big deal to you, whether you're watching a TV show, something streaming, a movie, real life, you're driving, whatever it is. And I don't just mean spectacular light, like, oh my gosh, look at that sunset. Right. I mean all light, knowing good light from bad light. The key to that is, is if you can see light, then you can create light. If you know what you like and, and how it... Um, the characteristics of what you're seeing, like, hmm, those are really strong shadows. For those st shadows to be really strong, that light source must be really far away or very small. That's just how light works. And just knowing that and getting, becoming, uh, making that intuitive, 
then you can create it. I always use the, the analogy of cooking. Unless you know what you're gonna, if, until you decide what you're gonna eat, you don't know what to go buy at the grocery store to put into what you're gonna cook. So you first have to decide, I'm gonna have this for dinner. Then you go to the grocery store and you buy that, the ingredients, and then you make it. Lighting is the same way. Once you decide this is the kind of look I want, you have that look, now you know what the ingredients are and you make it. That's a fantastic analogy. And it's funny because for me, so I'm a music photographer. I don't do a lot of lighting in that sense, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'll do a portrait now and then. I'm not great at it. But the way that I learned the difference in hard and soft light was not, mm -hmm. which I see a lot of people do. It was not by shooting with a bare bulb, shooting with a soft box, shooting with an umbrella, moving the light closer or further away. It was walking around my backyard. Yeah. And looking at the light at the different time of day based on where the sun was and trying to like not looking up and thinking about where the sun is. That's something we all do naturally, right? We walk out right. and we see somebody's long shadow going to the right. We know the light is to the left. And part mm -hmm. of the reason on this show that, which I, I told you about in the green room, that I describe shots in detail is because if you do that even with your own shots or if you try and dissect somebody else's shot, it's amazing what you will learn trying to figure, and you'll be wrong perhaps 90% of the time trying to, to reverse engineer their lighting, but at least you're thinking about it. Yes, that's key. Thinking about it is key. That's what I mean about paying attention. Um, I think all of us are guilty of this. You know, you, you, I don't wanna say we all kind of sleepwalk, but we're distracted. We're, we're thinking about 10 other things we're not noticing the things that are right in front of us. And to me, if light is a, a big deal to you, and to me, it really is. It's like, it's the most beautiful thing ever uh, to me is light. And whether I'm watching a, and it becomes distracting because I'll be watching a movie and I'll like, all I can see is the light and I'll, I'll, I'll I won't notice what happened in the, in the, in the plot, but the, you know, the light was great. It's, it's just something that is, um, um, it's a powerful tool to a photographer. Um, it isn't, and it isn't just a powerful tool when you introduce it yourself. It's a powerful tool just noticing how light, the way that it exists and how you can manipulate even just the sun without adding any of your own, just shaping what's already there. But it's a, um, I don't know, once you get into it, it's like, it's like any other part of, part of photography. Once you get into it, I don't think you can ever let it go, lighting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it, so I have known uh, for a couple of years a number of different Nikon ambassadors. A number of them have been on the show. Uh, McNally's been on the show a couple of times. Moose mm -hmm. Peterson's been on the show a couple of times. Deb Sandage has been on the show. Toddy Young is a music photographer like me, way better than me, but still a music photographer like me. Every brand has their ambassador, whatever they call it. But again, you're in rare air being a Nikon ambassador. What does that mean Certainly. to you? It means everything. Um, and it particularly means everything to me because of who Nikon is as a company. You would expect me to say what I'm about to say, but this actually happens to be true. Um, I remember when I joined the program in 2016, um, I was told repeatedly like, well, it's like a family. And I thought to myself, well, you know, of course. You would, you, would, you would think you'd hear that, but it actually is. When you go to one of those shows, you know, we mentioned like Imaging USA or CES or something like that, the people you see on the floor around all the cameras and whatnot, that's a very large portion of Nikon USA, right. those people. Though it, it, there's this perception that there's, you know, tens of thousands of people at some, you know, monolithic building somewhere. It isn't like that. There's a handful of people that really handle everything. And every single one of them are great people. I mean, they will help you and help you and help you. And so I, you know, to me, it, the, the becoming an ambassador was a huge honor. In fact, like I mentioned, my brother is also, he's a very excellent sports photographer. He works for the Associated Press here in LA. And he, um, I, I remember when I, when I took the call, I thought to myself, you called the wrong guy. You meant the other guy. 
And it's, you know, he and I have a friendly, uh, it's great that we're both photographers, we can share about it and whatnot, but it's a, it's a huge honor for me. And it's, the great thing is, is they don't have the, Nikon doesn't have this expectation um, other, th they have no expectation except for what is their mantra, which is to mentor, motivate, and inspire. That's all they ever say. That's what we want you to do. Mentor, motivate, and inspire. They don't want anything else. It's not about the gear. It's not about the lenses. It's not about anything. They just want, and the way I like to think of it is, is um, we're all photographers. We're all trying to get better. Right. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. It doesn't matter what level you're at. None of that matters. The way I always think of it is like, I'm pulling a wagon, jump in the wagon. I'll pull you along. And pretty soon you can pull the wagon and I'll ride. But that's the whole idea is like each of us have unique knowledge. Let's just share it and we can all use it. How's that sound? That's fantastic. And so a couple things to follow up on that. One, walking around one of the showroom floors, I, it was a WPPI. I knew I needed to meet Mark Cruz because I've had Mark on the show before when I did an autofocus episode mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, understanding Nikon autofocus. And, or Nikon autofocus explained, I forgot how I called it. We went through every, we used a Z9 as the example, went through every autofocus command on the camera and had Mark explain it. It was wonderful to finally put that face in real life. Right. You know, to, to my, my recollection of recording it. But the other thing is the the idea of mentoring and teaching and bringing people along with you is so important to me. I've had people on this show, no names being mentioned. There was somebody one time I I did what I'm about to do to you and I asked, you know, how they shot the shot and we talked about shutter speed and we talked about aperture and we talked about ISO and the response to me was, as soon as somebody asked me my exposure settings, I know that somebody's a beginner because you're never going to recreate what I have. And one person didn't want to tell me the exposure. And I had another guest on who's a good friend of mine, Adam L. Machias, and he had the most wonderful quote. You don't have a copyright on your F-stop, <laughs> right? If, if beginners out there need a baseline to start from, just share, just help them. Yeah. When they try the settings, they'll see that it doesn't work for them in that scenario. And in and of itself, that's a wonderful learning experience. Right. But we have to be able to share the knowledge that we have and and hopefully people learn from it. Before we get into the photograph, this show, again, for everybody watching, is available wherever you get your podcast. It's available either in audio only or a video form in a podcast feed. So if you go into your podcast app, there's two feeds. There's an audio only and a video version. Uh, that is, if your podcast outlet of choice supports video like Apple Podcasts does, if you're if you're listening on Spotify or Amazon Music or something like that, you're only going to get the audio only version. And in that case, you can head on up to YouTube. The video is also on YouTube. But one neat thing with Apple Podcasts is with the latest operating system update, 17.4, uh, the Apple Podcast app now has transcriptions for every new episode that gets released. So that's kind of cool because you can see a transcript of the show as you're watching it in Apple Podcasts. Again, show notes, links to everything that we mention are at the website, behindtheshot.tv. Find the episode that you're looking for. I write a little blog post about my guest, in this case, Joey. And uh, if you watch on YouTube, I don't have the full blog post, but I have all the links that we mentioned over there as well. So let's jump into this shot. Now, before we do, I, I kind of want to paint a picture for people. Do you name your shots? No. Okay. So sometimes I look at a shot and I try and come up with my own mental name if I don't know what the name is, something that describes it to me. And I have to tell you on this one, I have no clue what I would name this. This thing is so amazingly awesome and I'm in a different world and I'm in a 3D space and I'm experiencing color and refractions and uh, shadow and light. It's everything basically that I want in a macro shot. So let's start with the technical stuff. What body did you shoot this with? Body and lens. Um, this is the Z9 camera. 
and it was shot with the the at the time it wasn't even out yet it was the it's the z105 macro this was part of the launch campaign uh for nikon for that lens it came out if memory serves me may or june of 2021 and we did a uh, a number of i did i think 20 pictures that they could use in during the launch campaign and this was one of them so a z9 yes okay and what was oh your... no no my mistake my mistake z72 z7 oh, z7 mark ii okay with a with a yes. 105 2.8 what was your exposure right. on this that's right um let me i wrote it down just so i made sure i had it so iso 1000 one one sixtieth of a second okay. at f fifty one. Okay, we're gonna dive into the f fifty one because man, do I have questions. Yep. Manual white sure. balance or auto white balance? Uh, manual white balance and and a raw capture. Raw Everything capture. I shoot is raw. Manual mode or is it an aperture priority, shutter priority, something like that? I'm always full manual. Okay, so the elephant in the room. Yes, that lens doesn't do f fifty one, does it? <laughs> It, it it does. Um, it just doesn't do it the way most people think of. Um, it's one of the questions I get the most on, on Instagram. We were talking earlier about sharing knowledge. I mean, one of the things, like in all my Instagram posts, I, I put how I did it. I put all the capture information, everything from, you know, ISO, if I do focus stacking, how many captures are part of the focus stack. All of that is in the caption information. And I describe how the, the picture was made. I mean, as best you can in an Instagram right. caption. But um, one of the questions I get the most is about when I when I shoot something and I stop the lens all the way down and that's the, the f-stop. That f-stop is not the number you set. If you could set it on a lens, that number wouldn't exist on the lens. But what happens is, is as you magnify something, as you extend the lens, you are you lose light transmission in the lens so the effective light transmission becomes f51. The setting on the lens is f32 or 45, whatever it is. And but you, because of the loss of light transmission through the lens, you lose um, two thirds of a stop. It's 45, I think. Um, you lose two thirds of a stop, and that's how you end up at f51. Okay, so I I love that because the technical stuff, I. I would have gotten into photography way younger if I'd known that it was geeky because I've been a geek all my life and I just didn't understand that photography was geekiness, right? But yeah. once you understand how you're getting to that exposure, right? And again, just so that people are paying attention, one one sixtieth of a second, F51 right. based on what, what he just mentioned, and ISO 1000 fully manual mode and automatic white balance. For those of you that are on the audio feed, and I say this every show, it becomes really redundant how difficult it is to describe a shot verbally. But for those of you that are on the audio feed, I'm going to try describing this shot to you. But understand this is an abstract, fine art type macro shot, right? This isn't a picture of a person where I can say to you, he has you know gray hair and a blue jacket, right? This is something rather abstract. And what I want you to understand is it's a water droplet refraction shot. Now, we've all seen water droplet refraction shots. My buddy Don Komarechka has been on my show numerous times with this specific top topic, a water droplet type refraction. But there is an artistic twist to this shot, literally twist when you actually look at the rings that are in the background. So instead of what you see a lot of times where you have something refracted, uh, for example, a flower, a yellow flower behind something. We've all seen that a bunch of times. But in this case, there are two sets of colored rings in the background. So I want you to picture this as layers. And it's part of the reason this shot leaps off the quote unquote page at me. There's a black background. So imagine you have a black backdrop that you're shooting against, right? Then that's the far back. In front of that black background, you have concentric, concentric rings. In the upper left corner, there are six concentric bluish type rings in the upper corner. Bottom right corner, that's upper left. Bottom right corner, six red concentric rings. 
Each ring has a soft edge, and you can see the black between the rings. And the two sets meet in the center. And I love the way that they meet. So there's there's a symmetry here already that immediately jumps off the screen that feels natural and feels comfortable and floating in space on the third layer closest to us are these water droplet looking things of all different sizes refracting the blue and the red rings. This thing is beautiful. It's fine art. I have no idea. I mean, I have an idea, I think, but I don't how the water droplets were positioned floating in space. I have no clue what the heck the rings are, right? Uh, the black background is the only thing I can definitively say was a black background, and I'm probably wrong on that. But there, again, the, the best way for me to describe this shot to those of you that are driving an audio is I want you to imagine a symmetry of those two different colored concentric circles in the background with a randomness mixed in top of that of the refractions that adds this kind of yin and yang, right? There's there's a, a, a welcoming comfort and there's also a, a disorientated discomfort that are blended together so beautifully that this is the type of thing, I used to use this a lot. The way I, I always think about a shot is, how would that look in a large law firm on the wall behind the receptionist? And this is the artwork that you want on the wall behind the receptionist. It's just absolutely brilliant. Did I miss anything in that description? No, thank you. It's it's uh, it's ex it's a it's an excellent description. It, it, it really is. It so, um, what's fun to me is to hear you describe it and hear that it's somewhat disorienting because that's kind of the idea. Oh, really? Okay, good. So I got something right. Uh, it it but you see what I mean that you've got that that balance yin and yang is actually a perfect perfect term for me for this you've got the balance and i took the time i counted the rings of each color i checked where they're kind of intersecting in the middle and then the randomness and the scattering in the front explain tell us the story of making this well um it goes back to where i find subjects one of my favorite things to do is either open a kitchen drawer or go to a cooking store or a hardware store or someplace like that, a home store, that kind of thing, and just walk up and down the aisles looking for interesting subjects. And I'm, I always joke that I think I'm going to be arrested one of these days because I'll stop and I'll pick something up and I'll look at it. I'll hold it up above my head and I'll and I always, you know, there's security cameras everywhere. And I think somebody's going to come and, you know, you know, really put handcuffs on me or something like that. But it's the thing is, is if you're looking for things that have, uh, you mentioned concentric circles, I was looking for subject matter that was that was interesting, but also going back to lighting, something I could, I could use and exploit light with. So what these are, they're um, silicone trivets. They're the kind of thing that you would put a hot pan down on on top of oh. you put this on your countertop and then put the hot pan on top of it they were each five bucks that's their color one's one's um, um that turquoise blue color and the other one's red and so y your description of layers is perfect the what's what 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 we're doing here is we're looking straight down let's start at the back the back is a black background okay so that is the absolute bottom up about a foot, 12 inches, is a sheet of glass. And on that sheet of glass are these two trivets pushed up against one another. So they're just butted up against each other, um, touching. And then about eight inches above that is another sheet of glass. And on that sheet of glass is where the water droplets rest. How are you supporting so, the glass? Um, I have built, I have so much, we were talking earlier, we were talking about the technical parts of and the nerdy parts of photography. I've had to build so many things to make all this stuff work. This is a structure I've built out of parts that has um, 
it just allows me, it's got four posts and a platform and I can move it around and I can change the elevation of both pieces of glass so I can change the spacing. Um, I started off, uh, you know, short side story. When I first started doing water droplets, I wasn't sure I was going to do very many of them. And so what I did is I went to um, a home store and I bought PVC pipe and I cut them, cut like uh, slits in them so I could slide sheets of glass. I quickly realized that it's very hard to adjust that um, the way that I designed it. And once I had done a few of them and I'm like, this is kind of cool, it's fun. Um, I decided to go with something a little bit more structurally sound. And so it's essentially just, you know, four posts and a couple of like L brackets that hold the glass in place. So anyway, getting back to the, the description, once I had the trivets and I had them butted up against each other, and that's sort of where the composition starts is like, does this look good? Once I had that, then it was a matter of lighting it. And so what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to just rake light across the top of the trivet. So if the, if this is the trivet, I just want light just skimming across the top. So, you know, the concentric circles, what you're seeing is the highlight of the light hitting the tops of the circles of the trivet and the lights not reaching down into the groove. And that's why you have highlight and shadow. So that gives me, you know, some bite, if you will, it's not flat. It's got some edge to it. And, and that's a key, I would argue, for this shot as a viewer, is if if the angle of the attack of the light was too straight down, right, you would lose dimension greatly. True. In this shot, absolutely. Even though you physically have created different layers, that would have absolutely killed it. I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. Yes, it's particularly with water droplets. It's incredibly important to have. Um, I always call it tooth bite, something like that. Um, the things you think would work with water droplets oftentimes don't. And the ones that work really well are things like this, where there's edge to things because it gives the water droplets something to grab onto, um, you know, metaphorically. And so it ends up working, working better. So yeah, it, it, it actually is not that complicated. The, the complex part of it is, is just really finding the, the subject matter and then lighting it in such a way so that it has some interest to it. So one of the things I thought about when I first saw this, because like I say, I counted the concentric circles. There's six on each side. You've got that wonderful symmetry, symmetry and then you have the randomness of the water drops, both in position and size. Mm -hmm. I could see somebody overdoing it or underdoing it, right? Too many drops obscure those background elements or too few drops doesn't get you the the depth and layering feel that you want. So how did you decide that? Are you just putting drops on there? And by the way, how are you putting the drops on? Are you syringing it or what? But are you just placing drops all over and going, no, I need another one there. I need another one there. Do you ever go, I don't want one there and suck it back up into a syringe? What are you doing for position of the drops? That's absolutely right. Um, it's all, they're all applied with a hypodermic needle. Uh, I have different size hypodermic needles. Um, I use distilled water. Um, the key to this is you need something called Rain-X, which is a uh, Wax. Um, hydrophobic. I love saying that word. It's a high, it's basically people usually use it on their windshield so that water will bead. Um, you basically apply it to the glass, clean it off. And then what I do is I inject the water droplets where I want them. If one's too big, I can actually, I can absolutely stick the, the needle into the water droplet and take some of the water out. And that's actually key because this goes back to the whole F51 thing is there's a couple ways to hold focus. Um, with something like this. It that wouldn't seem like it, but what ends up happening is the water droplets, I always say, they sit up at a tension. That's what the Rain-X does. And so you get almost a perfect hemisphere. And because of that, your depth of field becomes critical because the top of the water droplet and the bottom of the droplet where it meets the glass, it's a, it's a good you know few millimeters. And at this kind of magnification, you can lose focus. So you can go at it a couple different ways. You can either stop the lens all the way down or you can focus stack it. If you focus stack it, you have much more control over 
how much of the background you see. And meaning when I say background, I'm talking about the trivets themselves, because what you're looking at is you're looking at the water droplets in focus, but then you're looking at the trivets out of focus. And that amount of focus, meaning of the trivets themselves, is a function of the f-stop of the lens. How much depth of field do you have? So if you, if you use focus stacking instead, you can control, you can make all the droplet, the entire droplet sharp while controlling how much of the background or the actual subject remains in focus. So I use both methods. In this case, I just stopped the lens down because I like the way the, the trivets looked. And you also have the layers of glass that are movable, so you can move them closer right. or further away from each other too. I, I mentioned we've all seen water droplets, you know, in front of flowers or you know on a twig mm -hmm. in front of a flower. Your work is anything but that, right? It's anything but predictable. So I'm curious. Okay, you're walking through the store, you see these things, uh, these you know hot plate items. You know you want to do the water droplet idea. But still, this is so elusive to my mind, right? I don't, I see it now. I would love to recreate it perhaps, but my mind doesn't create this vision in it. What is it? What's the inspiration in your mind to even see this in your head to begin with? Well, I appreciate the compliment. It, it's I'm looking for things that, that I think others might find interesting or might find confusing. Um, you know, I mentioned, I alluded to this earlier. I mean, so many of the things that I like to photograph are things that are common everyday items, um, like a wh kitchen whisk or a Pyrex dish or, uh, you know, things like that as I eat pie servers. They're interesting if you're trying to make them interesting. And that's, there's two parts to that. One is I'm, um, I had a, I had, when I was in, in art school, uh, a professor gave us an assignment that I never, ever forgot. The assignment was you have to take an everyday item and photograph it. And if anyone in the class can recognize it, you fail. It was a strict pass or fail um, assignment. So the idea was, is you had to take, find something photograph it in such a way that really, really concealed what it was. And that is a different way to think, meaning you're, you're trying to think of a way to, I don't want to say conceal, but just see it in a different way. And so I never forgot that. And it's, it just kind of opened up other possibilities. So if you look at something like a, a, something as common as a kitchen whisk, you go, well, oh, it's a, a whisk. But if you start exploring it, it suddenly becomes a landscape. And then if you start thinking about it in terms of highlight and shadow, color, non-color, that kind of a thing, now it's a landscape with all sorts of texture. And now if you start applying the tools of a photographer, like do I want this at minimum f-stop or maximum f-stop? Do I want lots of depth of field or no depth of field? What will happen if I shoot it wide open? How does it render that way? And what do I want the magnification to be? Right. So everything begins to change. And now all of a sudden you're seeing something that, um, like I say, instead of it becoming something like a barbecue brush, it becomes a landscape of wire. So that's, to me, that's sort of how I'm trying to see it. And, uh, you know, like I've, I've, I've mentioned this in the past, sometimes I'll go out with a, you know, like jewelers have the little loop, they like mm -hmm. the look at diamonds. I'll take those out with me and I'll like look at things in stores. Like, how's this look? particularly for texture and things like that. It's just a, um, it's active looking. It's, it's, it's a great way to think of it. It's active looking. You're actively looking. Is this, would this make an interesting photograph? Again, I want to be in the room with the guy watching the security camera going, what is, what, I know. what is he doing? That's just so weird. Looking at this shot, lighting. So macro is so much more than just magnification. Lighting matters so much in macro work. And you kind of describe the, the angle of attack of the light. It looks to me like the light was slightly top left, maybe. Is that about accurate? Yeah, yeah it's, it is. It's, it's very low. It's, it's probably only an inch or two 
um, above the level of the trivet. So it's literally raking across it. And this goes back to, you know, how does light work? Understanding that I have to carry the light from, you mentioned the upper left to the lower right, and I'll talk about it the same way. I have to carry the light across both trivets from the left to the right. And, in, and I have to do it in such a way that I can't, like what I always say, cook one side of it and have the other one be in dark shadow. So to do that, I know that the light has to be further away to be able to pull that off. It's going to carry further if it's further away. So it's it's applying the light in a way that's both interesting and then, you know, adding some highlights and, and some shadows and some place to add some interest. But the other part of it is, is controlling it so that I mentioned that there's about eight inches of distance between the surface of glass that are holding the water droplets and the glass that's holding the trivets. If any of the light lighting the trivets spills and hits the water droplets themselves, you'll see a highlight on every single water droplet. Oh, yeah. And so, so much of it is about control. You mentioned, you know, hey, you can adjust the, the, um, the height of each of the layers. Yes, you absolutely can. But if I lower the piece of glass that's holding the trivets, they will become smaller in the water droplet and you'll see more and more of the black. One of the interesting things that, I that happens in, in water droplet photography is since it is a hemisphere, it's like a lens. So even though the whole area that, that this shot is comprised of is probably, I don't know, maybe two and a half inches, maybe three inches in length at the most, the platform it's sitting on is 24 inches in size. And the reason is, is because you see out to the edge of the platform because it's like a fisheye lens. So y y all of this plays, th that they all work together in, in terms of how high or how low does that, that subject piece of glass need to be? Um, where is the camera positioned relative for magnification purposes? So in this case, I wanted the trivets to spill around the edges of the water droplet. If instead I wanted them to feel flatter, I could have lowered it. And what would have happened is we would have seen more of the trivet, trivets in terms of the subject, but they would have gotten smaller within the water droplet. And the part that doesn't have the trivet, you can see it in the water droplet that's black, would get bigger. That would grow because it would be smaller in size. So all of it works together. And that's part of the fun, is the dance. It, there's so many variables that are not variables yes. to success or failure, but variables to artistic choice and artistic result w was this yeah. one light um i think i think it's actually two i think i've got a little fill going on on an you know on another side um meaning on the red side i think i've got a little fill going but it's it's primarily the main light is coming from the upper left and what is the main light i use almost um i would say probably 95 percent of the work i do that's macro is done with led lights Okay. Um, I've, I've got six of them and I distribute them around as, you know, as needed. So I have to ask because we both know Larry from Platypod. Are you using Platypods in this? Um, in this? No, I'm not using it here. I, you know, I use the Platypods for a number of different um, things, particularly for light control. They're terrific for me to be able to get things like little mini flags, you know, piece, black pieces of fabric or sometimes little mini scrims that are only about this big into a place where I want to hold a little light off. Like with the a platypod gooseneck type is, arm or something? Yeah, exactly. It gets things into position that, uh, you know, in a really easy way. So post-processing wise, what apps do you use? Not a lot, to be honest with you. I'm not a, I'm not a Photoshop type guy in the sense of like, I don't, I don't, I don't do a lot of things other than I look for dust. And in a case like this, you know, where you're using two different sheets of glass, you end up seeing a lot of um, dust and and um, stray droplets, maybe that uh, that that you didn't want to see in there. So I don't do a lot of that. What I do do is I run everything. All my post processing is done in Capture One. Um, I've I've been using that for as long as I can remember. Particularly, I just think the results are fantastic. Um, and then um, I bring it into Photoshop, do a little bit of cleanup in terms of, like I say, if I 
see hair or something like that on the on the glass and then I'll oftentimes I'll add a little bit of contrast that's a typical thing just makes everything a little bit more snappy um, and that's that's about it if I'm doing something like focus stacking then I, I do get into some other pieces of software but um, by and large that's the pro that's the pipeline capture one into Photoshop and done well I, I gotta tell you this shot is so beautiful the colors, the lighting, the structure of the randomness of the drops. And, and the other thing I forgot to mention was, yes, the drops are both random in position and size, and yet uniform in the refraction that's inside the drops. So again, you, you have this kind of yin and yang of symmetry everywhere, including in the drops, chaos in the drop position, you know, contrast everything about this shot. I love. So thank you so, so much for, for talking about it. I, I really, really oh, appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It. So really fun. We're going to switch gears. Next part is a speed round. I ask you a question and you just simply come up with an answer, you know, out of, out of thin air. Let's start okay. general photography. What is your top general photography tip? Learn light. Okay. Top macro photography tip. Patience. Yeah, that's so true. Top portrait. I and mean, I can, I, I, I can, I can, I mean, if you want me to elaborate, I can certainly elaborate. I mean, it's, go for it. Patience is it's, it's twofold. One is, is that you need it for sure, because it's going to take a while. I just answered this question um, the other day with some, with another photographer where they were asking me, how long does it take to make some of the pictures that I make? And I, and I told them, I said, you know, it usually runs four to six hours and they were surprised. And I said, you know, that's just typical. It, it, it takes about an hour and a half to build a set. It takes about a half an hour to figure out what the composition is going to be. And it takes a good 90 minutes to light it. And then it takes another 90 minutes of refinement. Um, where, which I always think of like, you know, for those of you that like to write, you know, it, writing isn't writing, it's rewriting. It's the revision and the revision and the revision. And that's when you go from good to great. Right. Um, oftentimes I never get to great. I, I, it's rare that I ever get to great. I just want to get to better. And so the refinement part is the most important part, but you can't, you can't shave that time off. It's, it's, it's what it takes, but, and this is the big, but you get lost in it. And that's the joy of it in the sense that time passes in macro photography in a way that it doesn't pass in anything else. In the sense of like when you're outside and the sun is moving, you're frustrated because the sun is moving generally unless you're waiting for the good light. Or if you're, you know, you're in a studio and you've got 15 people in there with you, hair and makeup and assistants and everything else, there's pressure and, you know, control issues and all of that. When it comes to macro, it's usually just you and the time that's passing, you don't even notice it because all you're doing is working toward an end that only you can see. And all of a sudden you realize like two hours have passed and you don't even notice it. And it's one of the most amazing feelings. There's a, there's a psychologist um, who wrote a book called Flow and it's all about this. It's about being lost in creating. And macro is one of the only things I've ever found that where that is actually true, where you can find that. So good. Uh, what is your top portrait photography tip? Oh, gosh. Um, understanding the subject, I would say, knowing, knowing who it is you're photographing, knowing what's been done before and not repeating it, um, but really knowing your subject and having confidence in yourself that what you're about to do is going to be, you know, killer. You know, I'm going back to that last question in my mind as you're saying that. And I, and I keep thinking what you just described with the experience of shooting macro and, and time was a solo sport versus a team sport. And the joy that, yeah. that a solo athlete gets from, from you know, competing or doing whatever the case might be. What's the biggest photo mistake you made or almost made? 
Uh, that one's easy. <clears throat> and it's, it's something of a long, it's a little bit of a long story, but when I was uh, in, I was, I was studying to be a photojournalist, at, at least that's what I thought I was gonna do. And uh, I had a pretty severe accident um, right around the time I was finishing my photojournalism career or, or education. Um, and what had happened is I entered a contest, a photo contest while I was in college. It was the California Collegiate Photographer of the Year. And you entered five pictures, um, news, feature, sports, and then two of your choice. And so, you know, I was kind of a solo person. I wasn't the kind of person that would um, talk to other people, which is a huge mistake. And I basically decided on what the five pictures were going to be. I didn't consult my professor or any of my colleagues or anything. And I entered those, those pictures. And so then I had this accident and I couldn't go back to school. And so I healed from the accident and I went and took some extension classes. And it turned out one of the, one of the people teaching the extension class was one of the judges for the photo contest. And you were supposed to bring a portfolio on the first day of class. And when I showed it to him, he says, I've seen these pictures before. And I said, yeah, you were the, one of the judges in the California Collegiate Photographer of the Year. And he says, he says, oh, you won that thing, right? And I said, no, actually I was second runner up. And he says, oh, that's right, that's right. He said, you entered one, of the, one picture that was so bad we had to keep looking on the back to make sure that it was yours because the other three or four were so strong. You had the thing won, but you had this other picture that was bad and it almost knocked you out of the top three. Wow. And I was so ashamed, you know, like absolutely beat red as he's telling me this, but it was a lesson I've never forgotten, which is, you know, ask people that you trust, other photographers to, to be honest with you and tell you, is this any good? Is this a good picture, a bad picture? Don't ask people who are, are mean-spirited or critical or anything like that. It doesn't serve you and it doesn't serve anybody. But people that you trust will tell you the truth and it'll make you better. And um, I wish I had learned that lesson just a little sooner. Yeah, I think more people need to learn lessons like that. Only show work. Yeah that shows you the way you want to be seen. Stop doing photo dumps on Instagram. And I love what Scott Kelby says when he does some of his, his portfolio or image critique stuff. And he'll say, if it, you're better off having 10 pictures in your portfolio that are killer because if you have 20 and one of them is bad, all I'm going to think is which photographer am I going to get? Am That's I right. going to get the guy who shot those 19 or am I going to got, get the guy who shot that one? That's right. And it's absolutely critical. What is your favorite composition rule if you have one? I don't, to be, it's a great question. It really is. Um, I don't really have one. Um, if there is, if there is one, it's not to have one. Um, people will tell you, don't put the subject in the center. I put the picture in the center all the time. Diagonals running through a frame are fantastic. I tend to use that a bunch. Um, rule of thirds is almost never a loser. Um, but the, the thing I, I, I caution, don't get caught up in that kind of thing because every frame is unique. Sometimes dead center is exactly what the picture needs. And other times, I mean, I think of, you know, the, there's a fantastic picture of, um, uh, Igor Stravinsky that is, um, it's a very famous picture and it's, he's like in the lower left hand corner of the frame. It's like the piano and all this negative space and the, the maestro is just in the lower left hand corner of the frame. And I think most people will look at it and go, he's way too much out of the rule of thirds, but it's a masterpiece of composition. So, you know, the, the point is, is I don't think there is, is an ideal, um, take every frame as it comes and look for the best composition for that particular frame. What's your favorite band or performer? Steely Dan. Oh, great choice. Love that. Favorite movie or TV yeah. show? Jaws. Um, I want two. Okay. Jaws, because it's a masterpiece of filmmaking. And a movie called The Natural, 
Oh, uh, Robert Redford. Robert Redford, because it is a masterpiece of lighting. It's Caleb D. Chanel. Most people know Zoe D. Chanel, the actress. Caleb D. Chanel is her fa his, her father, who is that is one. Of, if you want to learn light, watch that movie again and again and again and again. Everything you need to know about light is in that movie. I I love learning little tidbits about movies. Just yesterday mm -hmm. on Twitter slash X, there was a thread from some movie account, like 42 tweet thread, describing how, because it's an anniversary for the film, how Memento was made. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen Memento. A wild film. Most of the scenes are shot in reverse or, you know, presented in reverse. The movie itself is presented in reverse. Fantastic actors. And it was so wonderful to learn some of the details about that movie. And again, one yeah. where the choices they made with composition and light uh, contribute so much to the storytelling. What's your favorite drink? <laughs> so many things. An Arnold Palmer. Okay. And the final question. Is there yes. any photographer out there that you think more people need to know about that more people should follow? There's so many. There's so many great photographers. I could never pick one. Um, but if There's people, so if people, many. for example, went and looked at who you follow on Instagram, that might be a good start. It would, but there's, I have to be honest, there are an awful lot of photographers from our past that are absolute geniuses. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, their work is worth studying. Uh, George Harrell as a Hollywood photographer, the lighting that Harrell did is, is just absolutely masterful. I would say if I had to pick somebody, um, it might be because I think, I don't know that there's a enough, um, I don't know, you know, to, as time goes on, of course, you know, people from the photographers from the past, they, whether it, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a sports photographer or a photo, photo journalist or whatever, the, you know, time passes and their, their work sort of, um, falls by the wayside. And I, I just think there's an awful lot of photographers from the past whose work is worth seeking out. Um, there are amazing books you can see over my shoulder. I mean, I have a whole bookcase full of nothing but um, people's work. And it's just so inspirational to to look at their work. So I would, I, would, I guess I would pick him. It's, it's interesting because I've had a couple of people on this show that are you know, arguably legends in photography, Richard Horowitz comes to mind. Yeah. And, you know, in some cases before, like, for example, I didn't know who Richard was until I had him on the show. And when I learned about him and his work and what he's done and that he, he grew up, you know, in the Jewish ghetto with Roman Polanski, they were childhood friends and their first and larger they made in a bathroom together. And you learn how these these artists came about is absolutely yeah. just fascinating to remind everybody images that we're showing. If you, if you listen to the audio version and you want to see the image, you can find that any of the links that we mention are in the blog post at behind the shot.tv. And Joey, if people want to find you, uh, what's your website? Where are you on social media? I've been, for those of you on video, I've been putting it up, for, but for those of you on audio, I want to make sure that we get it mentioned. What's your website? My website is uh, simple, joeyterrell.com. Um, my socials are always Joey Terrell, all one word. Uh, very, I, try, I try to keep it e easy and simple, but yeah, joeyterrell.com and uh, Joey Terrell on Instagram uh, is, is where I can be found. Again, Joey, thank you so much for doing this. It was a pleasure to meet you, and I appreciate your sharing all the knowledge that you've got. Pleasure, Steve. Great to be with you. Uh, the pleasure was all mine. Keep keep in mind, all the links, those are over at the website, behindtheshot.tv. Find this episode, blog post about Joey, and all the links that we mentioned, sample gallery of his work, as well as the shot that we talked about today. If you're watching on YouTube, head down to the description below the uh, like and subscribe button. 
All the links are down there, but not the whole blog post due to, to limitations there. If you want to find me, you can do that easily. It's at Steve Brazel on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, Blue Sky, whatever it is. And of course, my website is stevebrazel.com. Com. Thanks again to my guest, Joey Terrell. I really appreciate you being here. Make sure that you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. <laughs>